What is it that makes a great presentation? Now, this is, is quite a key question in my day job where I, I help folks stand up on stages and in front of audiences and get their message across, communicate their ideas. And some of them come to me and they say, Duncan, it's all about, it's about the feet, right? It's about getting the body language. Open, not oh, right, it's about the body language. And I go, good, good, yes, that's important. And some of them come to me and they say, no, 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 no. It's all about this. It's about my PowerPoint and my slides and my data. I go, okay. Something I've learned over the last couple of years of being really quite obsessed with this is that actually presentations are all about people. And people, as it turns out, are all about stories. For most of human civilization, our learning, our lessons, our news, our entertainment, our communication, our myths, our legends, all of that was shared and transferred by word of mouth and by storytelling. So I thought it was maybe kind of fitting to come here today and tell you a story. Are you sitting comfortably? Once upon a time, in a land far, far away. A young man was finished work for the day in the shop and he shut it up, he locked the door with a big wooden bar across it and he wound his way home through the streets and the back alleys to the home he shares with his family. He greets them and has a little bit of a, a rant about that one customer. You know, that one who's just, yeah. And then it's dinner time. And they sit down and they share a meal together and after dinner, well, then it's time for entertainment. And the young man's grandmother, she shuffles herself on the floor, sitting on the dust floor of their hut, and she goes, right, it's my time. Listen up. This is a story that my mother used to tell me. A story about a fisherman and a magic lamp. And oh, what a story it is. The young man loves it, he remembers it, and the next day he tells it to his friends as they sit on the steps of the temple, and how they laugh. Their laughter echoes out round the temple, it bounces off the statues. And then the story takes flight. It's told from person to person, told and retold, and it travels across the country, flies across the jungles and sands of India, because that's where we are. Two village elders sitting by a river chuckle to themselves as they hear the story. A young girl is enthralled as her father tells her the tale. It's told to a trader, and he loves it. He tells it every time they stop, every night, on the great trade route between India and Persia. And every time it's told, the story changes a bit. It's told and retold, every teller putting their own perspective, their own spin, their own twist on the tale. But it always maintains its power to entrance and enthrall its listeners. Until one day it's told to a traveling scholar who catches it and she writes it down. And she writes it in a manuscript full of hundreds of other stories myths and legends and folk tales that she's been gathering from all over the Middle East, from India, from North Africa, from China. And this manuscript would become a book. And this book would become the Thousand and One Nights, or the Arabian Nights, as they're sometimes called. And now the main story in Arabian Nights is one of a king and a princess and his bride. King Shahriyan is cheated on by his wife, and that's not great, but I tell you, he does not handle it well, okay? He has her executed, he has all of her lovers executed, and he embarks on this mad mission of punishment and revenge on all the women in the kingdom. He finds an eligible woman, he marries them, takes them to bed, and the next morning has them killed before they can betray him. It's pretty horrific. Not a good way to handle rejection. And this goes on, and the women of the kingdom are feeling a bit unsure, a bit scared. Something has to be done. Enter our hero, Scheherazade. 
Now, she's the daughter of the king's advisor, and against her father's protestations, she steps up. She sticks her hand up and says, pick me. I volunteer. I will take one for the team. I'll either fix this horrible problem, or I'm going to die trying. And so, they get married. They go to bed. And afterwards, Scheherazade offers to tell her new husband a story to pass the hours until dawn. The king says, all right, why not? Nice story. And so Scheherazade tells him a story, a tale about a fisherman and a magic lamp. And oh, what a story. The king's laughs echo round the palace. The hours pass swiftly, the dawn comes, the cock crows, but the story isn't finished. Jehoshaphat says, if you want to find out what happens to the fishermen, you're going to have to let me stay anigh another night. And so driven by his curiosity, his need to know what happens to the fishermen, the king lets Jehoshaphat live another night. You can maybe see where this is going. Every night, Shahrazad starts a new story. And every morning, there's a new cliffhanger, and the king has to know what happens next. And so, he leaves Shahrazad alive to finish each new tale. And this goes on night after night, until after a thousand and one nights, the king has been on such a journey, experienced so many incredible stories, seen the world from perspectives very different to his own that he's changed his mind. He gives up his quest for revenge and punishment on all women, and all is well with the kingdom, and all is peaceful again. That's quite an example of the power of storytelling to change behavior, to change the world. And the thing about the stories that Scheherazade tells, these folk tales, these myths, these legends, is that these aren't the stories of polite society. These are not the stories of the rich and the elite, not the stories told around gold-gilded tables. These are the stories told by everyday people. And they're rude. Oh boy, are they rude. They are gruesome and rude. People get drunk and have sex and break the law and stick two fingers up at authority figures. This comedy, romance, tragedy, horror, one of the first times we see the haunted house as a thing, well, that's in the Thousand and One Nights. And you'll notice that these are the things, actually, that we see in a lot of the storytelling today, because these are the things that people like to listen to and like to read. And because of that, the stories persist. They hang around. More versions are made, always with slightly different stories in them, but always Scheherazade tells stories for a Thousand and One Nights until the centuries pass. The tales keep being told, people keep reading them. And they make it to Europe in the 1700s, to France. And French society goes nuts for this, right? They absolutely love it. The scandal, the exoticism, the fantasy of this, this crazy world, right? They absolutely go nuts for it. And so it keeps going. The stories keep being told, they keep being printed. The decades pass, and then it's 1997. And I am seven. And I pick up this. This is a copy of Aladdin and the Magic Lamp by Fun to Read Fairy Tales. And it's very well loved, it's very creased. Because Aladdin is one of the stories that comes to be in the Thousand and One Nights. And the other ones that are really known here in the West are Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves and Sinbad the Sailor. And through this story, this children's book, I'm connected back through thousands of years and to millions of people who've told these tales, who've listened to these tales, who've read these stories, who've seen the film or watched the panto. Who here knows the story of Aladdin? Hands up. Excellent. And so I'm connected to you as well as you are all connected to each other in the experience of knowing that story. And this is important because these tales have persisted because we recognize at the heart of them something powerful, something important, the people stuff. 
okay, sure, they're full of magic and wizards and genies and like everyone can fly. If you've got a carpet, you can fly, or a horse, they can fly as well. Like everyone can fly. But they're also full of ordinary people. There are fishermen and traders and tailors and thieves. There is love and loss, power, ambition, pain, jealousy, delight, joy, people stuff. And it's to these characters that we connect and with these things that we feel a really powerful resonance. The true power of storytelling comes in the fact that by listening to a story, we get to see perspectives other than our own. We get to meet people and ideas we've maybe never come across before. And in listening to a story together, we share an experience that unites us. All things that I think a good presentation should do. So for me, a presentation is not about where you put your feet, or how good your PowerPoint slides are, or how hot your numbers are. Really good presentations, just like stories, are about connection. And I could stop here, because the power of stories to connect us through time and space, that's pretty cool, that's pretty amazing, but you know what? This here's a TEDx talk. So a little bit of changing the world, it's kind of required. Here's a thought. We all live on this tiny ball of rock that we call Earth, hurtling through space. And from where I'm standing, it's looking increasingly fragile. We're faced with problems. Climate change, pollution, overpopulation. Maybe we need to build a better future. And many, many, many TED Talks, if you're a fan and watch them, have told you that stories have the power to change the world. But which stories? Out there, loads of stories are told. But lots of them are about the rich, the powerful, the famous. And lots of them are told by the rich and the powerful because money buys you a platform. Might be a TV station, might be a newspaper, might be thousands of pounds worth of social media advertising. Are those the stories we need? Or do we maybe want something more like the Thousand and One Nights? The stories about real people for real people. Today, we will generate 2.5 quintillion bytes of data. That's nuts, right? That's a number too big for me to even wrap my head around. And that's extraordinary, right? It's amazing. We live in this phenomenal time when there are more electronic connections than ever before. And yet, somehow, it seems really easy to feel disconnected, to feel alone, to feel lost amidst the noise. To build a better future, we need to be better connected to each other. We need to be better at seeing perspectives other than our own. And I think that requires us to share stories, to share our truths. And that's truths with the human bits thrown in, all right? So not only the doctored Instagram pic that makes you look amazing, not only the always on, always happy, everything's okay cheerfulness, but the hurt, the pain, the uncertainty, the trials, because that's what it means to be human. So when you leave here today, I encourage you absolutely to find a stranger, a human being that you don't know that well. Laugh with them, cry with them, create and imagine with them. Share your experiences and really listen to theirs because their perspectives will change your perspectives. And it's our stories that will build a better future. Thank you. <laughs>